the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, episode 99. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you on episode 99. And today we go to Washington, D.C. and we speak with John Siciliano from the Washington Examiner. You can follow all his stuff at thewashingtonexaminer.com. We talk about what's coming up in Washington, D.C. as far as federal regulations go concerning the energy industry. I think you really enjoyed this discussion. So without further ado, here's my conversation with John Siciliano. Well, John, it's a beautiful day down here in the state of Texas, and it's a great honor to have you on uh, over from the Beltway. How's the weather in Washington, Washington D.C. right now? Well, it's um, it's unseasonably warm, actually. Um, it's usually muggy through most of most of the summer in Washington, but um, it it, and then it got it got cool quick in late August and early September. Not to belabor the point, but it's kind of like it's like ninety degrees. Oh wow! At, at the end of September, and it's usually, um, you know, we're uh, we're kind of waiting for summer to end. It's a long summer. Well, you know, it's a nice uh, mid eighty degree day in Texas, and so that's we always appreciate that anytime we can yeah. get it. But uh, you know, it, you brought you brought it up. It's you know, it's it's abnormal. And one of the things it seems like when you get on the internet today. No matter what you're talking about, if there's something going on uh, in in the in the in the climate, you know, if it's a hurricane, if it's a long summer, a short summer, it, it's around climate change or you know, government policy. We had the Paris Agreement. Uh, kind of give us a feel, just a thirty thousand foot view of what's going on in Washington as far as you know environmental policy is concerned. Well, um, there's a lot going on actually in a uh, in a lot of a lot of what is going to come up in in sort of the. Uh, either in Congress or within the actual White House and the administration itself, um, has a lot to do, surprisingly, um, to do with climate change in a, in, in even more surprisingly <laughs> in a proactive way. And what I mean by that is that we have, um, on the congressional side, we have sort of the rumblings about trying to insert a carbon tax into um, either spending legislation or more, it, more germane uh, tax legislation. And uh, it's sort of the early days of that, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And I wrote a, a magazine article. Our magazine comes out on Mondays uh, today on sort of there's a, there's an interesting dynamic going on that most people wouldn't expect. But conservative groups, there's a group of conservative groups um, – uh, like the Niskanen Center and R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. They're two think tanks, trade association, or not trade associations, but uh, some of them do advocacy, but they're major, mainly uh, focused on cons- usually conservative um, policies. But there's a group of these th- think tanks that are focused on um, getting a carbon tax um, into law or or at least debated on or they're advocating for it. Um and uh, or support it in in either their platforms or in some way, um, and then there's the more um, uh, sort of the post Tea Party groups led by um, most prominently Americans for Tax Reform, which is Grover Norquist's group, who r- rose to prominence probably in the last five years um, with his uh, uh, lawmakers pledge for no new taxes. And he is basically coming up with a bunch of other groups like uh, Americans for Prosperity and, and, a, and a variety of others um, um, who have had a lot of sway over Congress. And they're coming up and they're saying they're seeing what our street is doing and these other groups that are supporting a carbon tax. And they're saying these guys are not conservative. Don't listen to them. Why are they why are they even coming off as conservatives? And then our street would tell you and they as they told me, it was like, well, we, we like to work with Grover, but on this one particular issue, just the carbon tax issue, we disagree. And the Skane and Center with Jerry Taylor, which is a n- relatively newer libertarian group um, who's getting a lot of play recently on the carbon tax, says the same thing. And they're sort of butting heads <laughs> as they meet with lawmakers on Capitol Hill talking about a carbon tax. As this was kind of ramping up and I was talking to these people, Senator Graham comes out of nowhere uh, while well, he was at a Yale University 
uh, climate conference and says that he's supporting climate or carbon tax legislation or putting a fee on carbon. There's a diff- three or four different ways of calling a carbon tax something, <laughs> either a fee on carbon right. or putting a price on carbon. It all kind of boils down to similar or even dividends, um, that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, you have that. So you have that whole thing emerging. Then, on the same time, you have what's going on in Texas, which is a major record-breaking hurricane, and you guys are still recovering from that. And at least some parts of the Houston area, and there's super fun sites and other things that are still recovering. And um, you have the administration sort of trying to back away from environmentalists and other groups, saying. This is what we, in, you know, in, in, in climate scientists saying that this is what we are going to expect in terms of hurricanes from now on because of uh, a hotter climate uh, here on the planet. And um, that being a result of man-made causes, fossil fuel emissions, um, increased methane, um, hydrofluorocarbons, and uh, or <laughs> I think I said that wrong, but uh, HFCs. And uh, and other um, um, exacerbating effects uh, that have sort of risen uh, or, or, or raised the uh, average temperature uh, of the planet. And um, you have the administration. What was my point is you have the administration say we don't want to, we. This is not. A, I think President Trump recently said when he was asked about climate change and the effects on these hurricanes. Um. Uh, it, it, his response was something akin to, well, this isn't the biggest hurricane. We've, we've had bigger and trying to basically not want, you know, not give any kind of credence or foothold to an argument that would parlay into climate change. And, but, but surprisingly at the end of last week, there was, some leaks and <laughs> coming out of the white house and the white house conform confirmed to me on in, 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 in a lot of detail, actually that they started a series of meetings at the white house with all the major cabinet level agencies to start talking about what is the Trump administration's position on climate change and what are specifically, and this is their phrasing, climate change goals? What are the climate change goals of the, of the administration, and how we're going to talk about this issue? So, I mean, it says that that might say two things. <laughs> um, it might say that you know they you know they might be saying something different publicly, but behind closed doors, they've always tried to. They've been trying to kind of. Uh, figure out what their position is on this issue. Um, uh, it could say that some of the pro climate change folks like Rex Tillerson are having more sway, especially, um, after president Trump, um, surprisingly after president Trump made his decision on June 1st, uh, to roll back on Paris, that maybe they're making loud enough noise that he's maybe getting tired of listening to them and say, okay, well, we'll figure out something else. We, you know, we'll figure out a new direction. And then, you know, another, another part of it is that maybe, um, these, you know, these meetings were not known until the day they were having the first one, which was, I think Thursday or Friday. And, um, uh, it could, it could also say that they're a little, they're getting a little sensitive to some of the criticism, um, from, you know, and, and it's not only from the Democrats, although they're a majority of the critics, it's also coming from Republican sides to some degree, from the moderate side, from the Grams, from the Collins uh, folks and uh, Senator McCain. Um, so so there, there's something going on there. At the same time, uh, the EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, is still evaluating what road he wants to take on these so-called red, red teams. Or he wants to have a a uh, looks like a whole year of debates within EPA between a red team and blue team to basically hash out what is actually the um, the settle on science 
of global warming and what is actually occurring. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of the lay of the land. There's a lot of things going on and the noise is getting louder as we get closer to the end of the year. You know, one of the things that's, that's always frustrating to me about the climate change debate is that this is episode 99 of the show. And so we've talked to people who are, um, you know, we, we haven't talked about climate change a lot. We've had on a few people who have addressed it, um, some directly, some indirectly. And it seems like that, you know, of all the energy professionals I've talked to or reporters or whoever, who's ever involved in the energy business, we're all concerned about the environment or the climate, um, however you want to phrase it there. But it, it seems like we, we can't just sit down and have honest discussion. And one of the things you brought up there, you said, um, well, now climate scientists are predicting that hurricanes moving forward will be, you know, the seasons will be like this. And for me, it's not the first time I've heard that. Um, and so I'm not saying that it's yep. not true. I'm just saying it's not the first time I've heard that. And and it seems like we, we've kind of lost the debate to say that, you know what, I am concerned about the environment. I am concerned about the climate. I am concerned about how we, we take care of those things. But but also I am concerned about not having an honest debate because an honest debate should be one that talks about the problems with large modeling devices and how just you know small increments can be, can be off and all of a sudden the whole model is wrong. And we've seen that a lot of times as far as the climate change model predictions and how they've been off. Um, and, and I guess when you say that, hey, they're looking at having a, a year-long um, debates, do you actually think that these will be profitable, profitable debates where we can sit down and we can say, you know what, those are good arguments there. I can see where they're coming from. They're, they're actually able to challenge. Or will this be just kind of grandstanding to appease both sides of the aisle saying, well, Democrats, we are, we are hearing you on climate change. If Republicans, we're, we're fighting against climate change. But we, we really kind of have internally, uh, we already know what the result's going to be. Well, the... The, the, it's being framed as a way of getting the politics out of the discussion. So if you know, how they do that is yet to be seen, they're not really releasing that many details, but the, the movement going forward is to do what you're, you know, the, to address the concern that you're raising, which is there hasn't been enough of sort of discussion on the particulars of some of the modeling. And it is, always just a highly politicized, um, you know, discussion that, that puts us back in our corners, so to speak, and, you know, never the two shall meet kind of situation. So, yeah, I mean, they want to do what, what you, what you're, you know, you're putting forward, um, as, as the sort of more profitable way of discussing climate change, um, having, you know, the blue team, I guess would be, um, you know, sort of the, the UN, um, scientists, um, side, I would, if I could characterize it that way, um, which are, you know, represent just statistically, they represent the majority of climate scientists who basically have, if you want to just put it simply there, the, the, the proven science could be distilled down into like two sentences or even one sentence, which is, you know, carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas is increasing, um, or, or causing or exacerbating, however you want to frame it, um, the, 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 the climate, uh, and that the earth's temperatures over time are getting warmer and it is a direct result. This is the, that's the other part of it. It's a direct result of man-made, um, activities, which, you know, fundamentally can be distilled down as burning fossil fuels, either, you know, through tailpipes or through smokestacks, basically. Right. So that's the, that's the blue team on the red team. You're going to have, um, and, and I'm not, and I'm not debating which side is, is which right here. I'm just sure. basically framing what's going on. The Heartland Institute and, um, others, including, <laughs> I just found out in the Scanning Center who's advocating for uh, or is supports. I wouldn't say advocate. They don't necessarily advocate. They educate. <laughs> right. They they support <laughs> the carbon educated, tax right? and they just went into EPA HQ and talked to uh, um, uh, EPA about, about um, how to set up uh, the red team blue team situation. Um, so that and I think they're I think they're. Uh, talking more on the red team side, but I could be, I think they're just basically putting out their two cents on the blue team, red team, but like, uh, climate skeptics would be on the red team. So those, those would be the, um, 
uh, some of the people at the Heartland Institute, uh, as well as as others, um, who are usually considered the minority view on climate change, although some of them, um, uh, you know, uh, they 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 they've pointed out um, not not the Heart not Heartland Institute themselves, but some of the affiliated scientists have have pointed out different things that are that um that that a lot of people have uh, or uh, you know people have 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 noted um it hasn't really filtered down necessarily into the IPCC the UN um discussion on on climate change um but that that's where i think Scott Pruitt in the White House want to see more of not necessarily just heartland but more of the um things that have been sidelined over the years in turn that, that that have questioned the general findings of of uh the majority of climate scientists in the UN and and give them um give them their two cents and see what well, okay you say this but what about this and see how the two work out that issue. And then they'll say, well, we say this, you know, red team says this, blue team, what do you say about that? And blue team comes back and then red team goes, well, we think this. And what do you think about that? How, you know, how does that, how does that jibe with what the general discussion has been? So I think they're going to get in the nitty gritty. I think it's going to take a long time, whether or not, (laughs) whether or not people want to watch that, um, I mean, me, people like me and you will, right? Uh, obviously, but um, the general public, I'm not sure how. Uh, you know, I, I think that and I think that's one of the issues that they're trying to work out is how do we make this sort of a saleable thing to the general public to get involved with this? And we think we have, we think we can. You know, I think the administration wouldn't be doing it if they didn't think they could get something out of it. So. Um, it, it, you know, and President Trump is very uh, attuned to how the general public responds to something. He's always talking about ratings and things like that. And and there's been some discussion or suggestion that this could be a televised thing. So, yeah, I was just going to suggest if you could, you know, live stream it on YouTube or you know C-SPAN or, or wherever. I think there's definitely some segments that um, large portions of the you know the population would be interested in. And I would just I would just throw this out there. I think that. For me, going into it, I'm excited that if we can sit down and go, okay, um, we're actually going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about the problems that both sides have laid out. One of the things I've, I've tried to say is that as an energy, energy professional, I'm always concerned first with getting people energy. Uh, if they don't have energy, we in America, we kind of take it for granted because I'm sitting in an air-conditioning room. You mentioned mm-hmm. it's hot in D.C. I'm sure you're sitting in an air-conditioning room. The lights are working. We kind of just take for granted that energy's here uh, for us. We, we kind of forget that a lot, a, lot of, a lot of spots around the world, there's just not access to reliable or energy at all. And so so um, I, I hope we can tone down the rhetoric and, and, and say, you know what, uh, left side, r- blue team, red team, left side, right side, whatever. We don't have to name call. We don't have to do this. We just sit down and say, you know what, you you said this. It didn't work out. Why were you wrong? And, and, and you know, we, we, we have to be able to own that we make mistakes because, good grief, we, we all make them. And so hopefully that there can be a little bit of humility going into here and actually going to find um, – you know, find out what the truth is. And I, and I think personally, um, if there's not a lot of grandstanding, there's actual good, honest debate, mm-hmm. which which you rarely see in Washington or anywhere else for that matter. Um, you know, uh, we, we could probably do a lot of progress because of all the energy professionals I've talked to. Um, one of the things, it's, it's just a theme. We're all concerned, but we just don't necessarily agree on what the concern level should be, how we should approach it, or how we should tackle it. So being able to have good, honest conversations, I think would be helpful for the energy community um, because I don't know, if, I'm sure there's people out there, but I personally don't know of anyone who goes, you know what, let's just go out there and uh, just pull pour barrels and barrels of oil or nuclear waste. You know, I, don't, I don't know those people. We're all trying to figure out what's, <laughs> what's proper. And I think one of the things, and uh, we'll move on to the carbon tax in a second. I'll get your thoughts on this. I think one of the things that, that eventually needs to be addressed, especially in the U.S., is um, you know, landowner rights. And I talked about this. We had on someone from the Heartland Institute. I said, you know, in my opinion, if we gave landowners more rights, more, more ability to hold companies accountable when they tore up their land, they polluted their land, um, I think that would actually be more effective than government regulation because, as we know, 
government regulation is influenced by who's in office, and who's in office is largely you know uh, controlled by who the big companies, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, who they support. And so you know what, if your guy comes in, puts a bill forward you don't like, well, the next time you fund someone else, the landowners they're there. And so uh, I think that um, sometimes we look to Washington for answers, and you know we, we get a lot of grandstanding, we get a lot of talk, but you know if you had a Bob the farmer who actually had the, the the proper capacity to go and hold companies accountable it would probably it would probably make them a little bit more more scared but I'm curious your thoughts on that um my thoughts on on giving them more rights well yeah land, I, I, right. allowing the landowners to um because a lot of, a lot of the problems if you look at especially like pipelines is it spills um and so then you have uh, some kind of government program who's coming in they're overseeing it they're they're you know they're they're passing they're they're, they're saying this you got to do this you got to do that and the landowner they're they're part of the process but really the landowners the afterthought they it's really the the oil and gas companies are more concerned with what government regulation you know they violated and it seems like the landowner um, who was really the only person who was affected, if it, or landowners, depending on how big the spill was, um, they're kind of the afterthought. It's like, okay, let's go pay them off, and then let's figure out how to make sure the government doesn't come down on us. And my thought is, you know what, the landowner, they're, they're the ones who was injured here, not not the government. Um, and so it, it kind of seems like um, the, gov- the, 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 the you know, these companies, when there is a problem, they know that, you know what, we can push aside the person who was injured and go to the person who wasn't injured and try to appease them. Yeah, I think... Um, uh I think you see that in well, in pipeline cases uh, when uh, um, I mean some of the I think you see maybe the beginnings of um, that discussion happening. I, I'm not sure exactly how it's working out in Texas. You, you have a much more mature uh, energy regulatory system um, that's used to dealing with pipelines a lot more than say Pennsylvania and Ohio. Even though Pennsylvania was one of the first oil states, it has not right. <laughs> it, it, over the years, over the last hundred years, has not really kept up with regulation because they sort of tapped out very early. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you have a lot of eminent, eminent domain issues coming up right now as, you know, fr- fracking ramps up in Ohio, um, in the Utica and in the Marcellus and um, states, state public service committee commissions, um, you know, Basically, uh, in approving some of these lines as they get through the FERC process, the the, the federal side of the process for permitting, um, moving along the track of the uh, you know the the, the state commissions, um, and people tr- people that have never experienced eminent domain for pipelines before are finally they're like, what am I supposed to do? This is my business here. You're right. putting this. You need to put a compressor station. What's a compressor station? I don't know what that is, and, and, you, and you're gonna put it in my driveway, <laughs> right? Right. And, and and wait a minute, this is uh, this is next to my, you know, this is next to my car dealership, and I I need to, you know, I I need an inventory stored here, and then, uh, you know, how does and, and that that land I had to develop before, um, I I mean I could have had to I could develop into something else, you know, or sell it off to someone else. It's just devalue my my property now. You're getting those kind of discussions. And um, I think the pipelines, for, to, just just from tertiary discussions I've had, is it seems like um, with 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 people on the ground, it seems like that um, it, it's it's kind of a shocking thing at first. And it would have been, <laughs> but for the pipeline companies, it's kind of like, yeah, this is what we do. Right, we do this all the time. We have lawyers. We have like you, you're just you're just becoming landowner. You're just becoming aware of this. We have three lawyers are already figured out four different ways to confront every one of your concerns. And when you come, yeah, you know, but there's no one really to explain what the process is that's going on and what my rights are. So, um, I think you're going to hear more about that. It's an interesting issue you bring up because it's, it's on the ground, the on the ground stuff, um, and how a lot of things get worked out, um, isn't always, um, uh, you know, the, uh, at, at fir- the first thing in discussion in, you know, Capitol Hill type hearings right. on different issues. They're always talking about tax credits and how to move this thing here. And, and when you, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, uh, it, the thing it, sometimes, and maybe the, the policymakers used to have maybe a better handle of this on this 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, but you, I always see energy development as kind of a follow through. You do something in Washington, um, you in a process or a, a policy gets enacted, 
but there's never enough follow through through all the steps and there's never enough explanation and different groups take it, it creates a little bit of a vacuum and groups like environmental groups and you saw this during the campaign groups like 350.org and 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 uh, some of the anti-fossil fuel groups you know they they took a hold of that vacuum and stepped right into it and framed the entire climate argument over things that maybe not necessarily in every state would have been a climate argument they might have been you know people shocked by giving up land under you know situation of eminent domain but that um uh, you know, uh, a, a, a very swiftly and well-organized, uh, environmental sort of camp came in and took over and got, fun, and got people on board for an anti gas or anti oil sort of position. Um, but yeah, yeah. I don't know if I want to yeah, no, no. I think that's great. And, and just one, one more on this, and we'll move on. And, and I think one of the things that you kind of touched on there is, is that the for the oil and gas company standpoint, I'm not trying to make them out to be the bad guys. It's just that if you think about it like this, if you go, okay, well, regulation six two point seven five whatever says I got to do this, it may be a pain, but you know what it is you got to do. Um, and so you know when you talk about pipeline companies getting their permitting process and trying to figure out how they're going to go through eminent domain or whatever, um, you know, there, there's government regulation steps that they kind of know that they have to follow, which then puts the government as the primitive way to how to figure out how they're going to do these things. Yes, they have to do with landowners, but it makes the landowner who is the actual quote-unquote injured party, we'll call it here, secondary. And so, it, you know, the government kind of takes the focus and makes it makes it about the government, whereas the landowner who's actually being impacted in this case um, is secondary. And so it's, I'm not trying to blame the gas company, oil gas companies here, because it's just the way uh, the law works. Yeah. It's just it's just the nature of yeah. the beast, which kind of brings me to the carbon tax I want to talk about. Now, I am not a big tax guy just about for anything, much less for carbon tax. Um, and, that, and the main reason is because it seems like no matter how you tax it, uh, well, okay, uh, oil and gas company or, or a coal company, whatever, yeah, they're paying it, but ultimately it's me, the consumer, who has to pay for this. And then it, it, it shifts the way the market should work. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on the carbon tax? My thoughts on the carbon tax. Uh, for, uh, I'll go. I'll, I'll take the cynical part first. Um, uh, Two thousand nine, <laughs> we had a major um, climate debate uh, where we saw. Um, even going even back in the 2008, uh, when the House sort of had control of that uh, of the of the lower branch of con- Congress, and pushed out Waxman Markey, um, and then we had like a year, year and a half of kicking around a, a cap and that was a cap and trade that wasn't carbon tax, um, uh, a, cl- a cap and trade um, bill in in the Senate, and it ultimately didn't go anywhere and stalled out. Um, and we haven't had really a serious climate debate ever since. Um, we, you know, there there there's some there's some buildup uh, of discussion about a carbon tax, but I think that's mainly because people are see cap and trade as sort of a you know a, a, a pariah, a policy, so to speak. And what else do we got there? Uh, well, we have regulation that didn't turn out very well. We had the Clean Power Plan, um, which is the Obama administration's attempt to go around Congress because of the intransigency of the um, uh, of the Senate and try to do it by regulation. Most people on the environmental side, at least environmental mainstream groups like NRDC and uh, industry groups don't prefer EPA to do this. Um, it was the thing that it was in play. So yeah, the environmentalists got behind it, but in generally they, they rather see this worked out through the legislature, through Congress. So, you know, both sides of the aisle kind of know the state of play on this. Um, most of the Republicans are against, you know, long sort of, far-reaching regulation from EPA, of course. Uh, most, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say most, but some Democrats, I, I know maybe, <laughs> they maybe don't say it publicly, but I, I think they're of a similar mind that regulation is not the right way. It's sort of the hammer when really you need a scalpel. You need something that's very, very delicate when you're dealing with the economy. So carbon tax is coming up because it's sort of a default. And maybe they haven't really paid attention to all the details on how it's going to be worked out. But um, 
uh, you know, there's there's some details. You know, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's a lot of people who have been working on this for years. You know, revenue neutral, um, border adjustment tax, um, you know, value added tax, and, and dealing with those two issues, whether to have it or not to have it, along with the carbon tax. But I, I, I think it's not going to go anywhere. Um, <laughs> that's what I said, my, my cynical take on it. Right. We've been batting around these issues for so long. There's such a cluttered debate. They become highly politicized so quickly. Um, I think um, uh, rather than make them highly politicized, I think there should be some kind of way of the administration to try to get their handle on the issue and not let others fill in the vacuum. Like I said before, there's a, you know, there's always a vacuum and you may be, you know, doing what your base, uh, you promise to do your base, but you're, you're creating, uh, an issue that's just going to keep on hitting you. And, um, rather than, you know, ignore it completely, you could work out something. And, and, uh, I mean, the, the Bush administration were George W., Worked it out through, you know, supporting. He was going to do it. We're not going to sign on to any major, you know, Toyota Treaty or or Copenhagen or or, or, or one of the uh, the UN treaties. We're going to work on supporting um, clean energy technologies and, and 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 move that that ball, commercialize those, and then see whether or not you know at the end of that process we actually need some kind of regulation. Um, I think you know, we're talking about before the White House having these discussions and uh, on what their climate goals are. I think you might see something like that emerge. But as far as a carbon tax, I don't think it's going to go very far. Certainly, if there's certainly it's not going to be standalone legislation. And I just don't see a tax reform debate, including this thing, um, anytime soon. Not not this year. Not in the next you know three months or so. Um. So there's going to be a lot of talk, but we'll see what happens. Well, this has been uh, – we've covered a lot, and so yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you, where they can follow you. you it looks like on the uh, website here you have articles that go out just about every day, sometimes twice a day. So um, for people who want to follow more of your work and what's going on with uh, environmental policy from D.C., where can they uh, catch you at? Yeah, well, we we just launched our daily on energy. We have a whole newsletter that goes out at um, 11 a.m. So you get uh, most of what happened the day before, as well as breaking news up until 11 a.m. that day. Um, uh, so if you want to know what's going on in D.C., that's a good way of uh, sort of checking out our coverage. Uh, but uh, we're remaining through our website, WashingtonExaminer.org. You can also get access to our um, Monday um, magazine. Our, we have a hard, glossy cover magazine. It comes out, and we have lo- sort of longer form, deeper dive issues. My carbon tax story uh, just came out today in the magazine. Um, so, yeah, uh, look for our we, – we, on Twitter, um, I'm at John, J-O-H-N-D, Siciliano. Um, but if you look me up, uh, uh, as Washington, Washington examiner, you'll find, you'll find us listed just about anywhere that, um, that, that tracks our stories. Um, yeah. So, you know, tune in, we're online. Uh, if you're in DC area, we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're in, um, we have our, you know, our little stands. So pick up a, a free copy. Okay, great. We'll link to that in the show notes, which you can find at globalenergymedia.com. The website is washingtonexaminer.com, and we will link to your Twitter as well. I don't think there's a, um, for my money, you know, fi- following the right people on Twitter is worth its weight in gold. And so I spend about uh, half my time with my Twitter feed open with the different energy reporters that I follow and, you know, seeing what stories they're breaking because um, something's always going on, you know, whether it's U.S. or abroad. And so uh, we'll link to your Twitter profile as well. John, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. 